Okay, let's start over. Outpatient manager pulmonary embolism. Um, and again, the outline um, they just talked about. So let's go over the first question. So 55-year-old male, past medical history, notable for hypertension, presents shortness of breath and chest pain. One day earlier, he returned, from, uh, returned to Washington from long haul flight from Tokyo, Japan. On exam, his blood pressure, um, 125 over 80, pulse is 105, <coughs> rest rate is 18, satin 99% on room air. Um, presentation to the ED, they did a CDPE protocol that, that showed a large thrombus in the right pulmonary artery. So the patient was starting to have present chances to the floor for further management and monitoring. What is the best course of action? So these are the answers. So uh, possible answers. So start uh, warfarin discharge once the INR therapeutic, discharge the patient oral anticoagulation with noxiparin bridge, transfer the patient to MICU since he's tachycardic and tachycnic, please don't answer that. Uh, place an IBC filter due to high risk of um, uh, venous thrombus and recurrence, or order lower extremity dopplers. So you guys can go ahead and start answering. Twenty-two, twenty-three. Okay, we'll go ahead. So yeah, so um, fifty-seven percent got the correct answer. So this, uh, so these questions I made up. They're not board. They're not sheet questions. They're not board questions. Don't answer these questions. Similar questions like that on the boards, and don't be mad if you do and get it wrong. So these are what I think the correct answers are. So um, B. So let's see why. So this is a. Um, ACCP guidelines regarding this. So the first thing they talk about DBT. So uh, the language is pretty specific. So they recommend discharging patients through straightforward DBT with adequate home circumstances, home rather than admitting to the hospital. And that's what we mostly do. I remember when I was doing telemedicine, medicine, I had a patient with low uh, um, swelling. We got him to ED. Had a, um, uh, he had a Doppler's there, and he was discharged home, never admitted. But that's not the case with PE and. Even though a lot of the evidence now, and I'm going through the evidence, shows that you know patients with low risk can be actually discharged home safely. That's not what we do. A lot, most of the patients, not all, who have PEs are immediately admitted to the hospital. So this is what they recommend back in 2012. They said, you know, if the circumstance is adequate, we suggest maybe, yeah, show discharge them home. Um, and that's a great 2P recommendation. That was 2012. So let's look at the evidence. So this is, Cochrane did a review last year looking into this, so outpatient versus inpatient management pulmonary embolism. So Cochrane are very, they're very um, specific about the research, so they only include like randomized controlled trials. So they did a screening of all the studies out there, so it was like almost 2,200. Only one included, were included in their review. So it kind of went from a systematic review meta-analysis to more of a journal club. So. So just that one, so that just that one study, and this is the study that actually they, they cited. So this is the only study out there that's randomized. So it's Lancet, 2011. And what they did is that they had patients who were diagnosed with PE. Um, so they had patients who were diagnosed with PE in the in the emergency department, and they're low risk for um, complications. And they use a PASI score, which I'm actually going to go into and talk about further. But anyone with a PASI score of less than 85 is deemed low risk. And then they randomized them. So either they would be admitted in the hospital, and and then um, the doctor would start anticoagulation, and discharge whenever they, th they thought it was safe, or they would discharge uh, immediately home um, on a, um, on anticoagulation. And what they found is that there's no, uh, it was non, so outpatient management was non inferior when it comes to uh, recurrence of uh, venous thromboembolism, embolism, mortality, and uh, major bleeding. And the length of stay obviously was much uh, lower. So. And that's the only study we have there that's randomized um, and prospective in, uh, in design. Now there are, uh, so this is a PASI score that I was talking about. So it's basically, it's a study that's very well validated and they, uh, they created this study looking into 30-day uh, mortality from pulmonary embolism. And um, there's 11, um, 11 variables and a score of less than 85 is considered to be low risk. There's also a simplified PASI score and a score of one, oh, I'm sorry, zero would be um, deemed as low risk. Um, and I actually looked back and to see how they actually made the PASI score. So they didn't actually, I thought, they didn't include like the size of the, of the tumors, oh, I'm sorry, not tumors, but the embolism on the CAT scans. Um, but I guess if someone has a large PE, they would have be tachycardic hypoxic. So they looked at the other these variables. They even they didn't look at RV strain or any um, echo findings to look at that if that had any significance. And uh, their reasoning for that was just because not all of them had that data, so they didn't really include it. 
Um, so these are the 11 variables, and like I said, it's been really well, well validated in multiple trials, multiple institutions. So uh, this is another meta-analysis that I found. It was published two years, uh, three years ago now in the European jour uh, Respiratory Journal. And again, compared outpatient versus inpatient. So it's a meta-analysis. And um, what they found is that when, when you look into recurrence, so they classified the group's home treatment, which is a discharge immediately from the emergency department, or early discharges within three days, and then anything longer than that would be hospital treatment. And they found that there is no difference in, in recurrence of venous thromboembolisms, whether it's a DVT or pulmonary embolism. There is no difference in bleeding. So if you discharge someone, there's no difference in bleeding in all three groups. There was a tendency for increased mortality for those patients that would, um, uh, for that, those patients that were um, treated as an outpatient. But once they excluded those patients with cancers and malignancies, the dif there was no differences at all. So it might cite that patients with, with active cancer maybe should be admitted a month further. But those patients who are, who are not and are straightforward um, probably can be discharged early. And this is, a, this is the right group. So, again, I'm adding this, so this is another scoring system that just came out last year. And the reason why I'm adding it, other than it's relevant to my talk, is just because it's also been published last year, I think August, in the Blue Journal. And it's a very well done study. They looked into, um, uh, what they did is they wanted to look into um, recurrence of um, venous thrombolism, thrombolism uh, mortality, and bleeding within 10 days. And they did a logi logistic regression on different variables. And what they found is uh, these variables were uh, significant in their study. And um, a score of zero, anything or anything less than one, shows the patient is, is low risk. And then what they also did, and what's very important, is after creating this, it actually went for a very uh, complicated um, validation of the, the scoring system themselves. So they actually had 18,000 patients, and they, they um, calculated the right score, the PASS score, and, this, uh, and the simplified PASS score on all of them. Um, and what they found is that uh, this all, I mean, all three tests technically had a very high sensitivity and a very high uh, negative predictive value. They did have a low specificity and positive predictive, uh, positive predictive value, but that's okay. What you want is you want to you want to test that is very very sensitive. So you want to know that if you discharge someone home, he's not going to drop dead within the next few days or die because he's he bled or something like that. So you want to be comfortable that when you discharge someone, that the likelihood of him having any of these uh, complications, such as bleeding mortality on a, re a recurrence, is actually very low. So that's what you want. You want to when you want a test that has a very 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 low false negative predict predictive value, and that's what this test, all of them show. You might have patients who have a you know, high score who do fine in the hospital, and that's fine for now, but we want to know that patients who are discharged can be safely discharged. And that's what all these tests actually, uh, studies, act um, uh, scoring systems actually show. So, uh, you know, I talked about, you know, Cochrane meta-analysis, I talked about, um, you know, logistic regressions, but this is actually my favorite of, um, uh, study of them all, so it's a small retrospective chart review. But what's special about this, it was done here. So it was done by, um, it's, um, it's a case, uh, it's being published, or not published, it's been worked being published, but it's actually um, gonna be presented in uh, Society of Hospital Medicine sometime, I think last, uh, last year. And what they did is basically they looked at uh, everyone who got admitted with pulmonary embolism, and they calculated the PASI score, and they found and compared the patient with low and high, and found the patient who had low um, PASI score, at it, again, um, within 90 days, that decreased um, mortality, um, risk of bleeding, and recurrence. So at least it works uh, uh, at Henry Ford, so more of a reason to use it. So these are, again, so the guidelines um, kind of still state that, you know, we suggest discharging them home. But I think, you know, patients who are low risk, especially those, in, you know, get transferred to F2, if they have a low risk, whether w whatever scoring system you use, and they have adequate home environment, you can actually discharge them home safely. So next thing I want to talk about is anticoagulation. So this is a coagulation cascade haunting us from medical school again. So we'll, you know, warfarin works on factor two, seven, nine, and 10. We've got low molecular weight heparin, what works on both factor um, 10A and um, thrombin. We've got fondaparinox, which works on factor 10A. And new, now we have the new agents, and I'm going to focus more on these new agents. So we've got rivaroxam, adoxabam, and vixabam, all FDA approved, um, work on the uh, direct uh, t uh, factor 10A inhibitors. 
And then you've got the bigatron, which is a thrombin uh, or a 2A inhibitor. So I'm going to talk about mainly focus on these new, new agents since the most there's a lot of studies that came out um, about them in the last four or five years or so. So first one would be um, rivaroxaban, and um, so there was a se like in the last four years, there's like a series of uh, studies that came out, mostly in New England Journal, talking about all these medications, uh, looking into stroke, looking into AFib, and looking into um, pulmonary embolism. So this is a Einstein PE study looking at specifically in pulmonary embolism. And what they found is when they compared, um, um, what they found that rivaroxaban was not inferior to Coumadin when it comes to um, recurrent um, venous thromboembolism and bleeding risks. The duration of uh, anticoagulation was in three to 12 months. And also the groups that included cancer patients, patients on estrogen therapy, thrombophilic patients, and history of previous uh, venous thromboembolism. The dose is usually 50 milligrams twice a day uh, for three weeks and then 20 milligrams daily. And then you've got uh, Abixabam, and this is an Amplify study. This contained basically venous thrombolysis, so PE and DVT. I think about 35% of the patients had pulmonary embolism, while the rest had DVTs. And uh, what they found is a well, randomized um, double-blinded study, and again, they found no difference when it comes to a recurrent uh, venous thrombolysis and mortality. But what's, uh, what's impressive is actually their bleeding outcomes were less with um, Abixabam compared to Coumadin. So it actually met, met their superiority um, endpoint. So less risk of bleeding uh, when it comes to Abixabam compared to Coumadin. And treatment was uh, for six months only. Next, oh, and this, so there's a, a study that came out last year in a journal of thrombosis and hemostatus, and they just basically looked at the cancer patients in that study uh, specifically. And they found in patients with active cancer, um, there's no difference at all in um, a recurrent venous thrombolysis or major bleeding. And in patients with history of cancer, not active cancer, actually the risk was lower uh, for recurrence and major bleeding which showed that there's no difference. Now this is a much smaller group and a sub subgroup analysis, so, uh, but uh, again, in cancer patient doesn't seem like there's much difference. But um, I'm gonna talk about that more later on too. Next medication, adoxaban. So this is FDA approved a year now, so January 2015 was FDA approved and we can use that and um, what they did as well uh, is a randomized double blind study comparing to Coumadin, and they found it was not inferior to warfarin when it comes to recurrent uh, venous thrombosis, and yet it again met the superiority standpoint when it comes to bleeding, so less bleeding risk compared to Coumadin. Um, the dose is 60 milligrams daily. Um, it has to be adjusted though for pa uh, patients who with uh, weight less than 60 kilograms or with um, chronic kidney disease. And then there's the last one, so Dabigatrin. So um, this is a Recover 2 trial. There's a Recover 1 which had a lot of deficiencies, so they wanted to make a, uh, they made a Recover 2 which was published in circulation in 2014. And it, again, randomized double blinded study. And it's a, so Dabigatrin is a direct thrombin inhibitor, so the other three medications I talked about are uh, 10A inhibitors. And again, FDA approved, and the dose is uh, 100 milligrams twice a day. And what did the results of the study show? So this is um, the results when it comes to um, recurrent venous thromboembolism, and you can see that there is no difference at all when it comes to um, dabigatran and Coumadin. But what's again interesting about the medication is that when you look at bleeding risk, so the line here at the very bottom is two lines here. This looks at basically major bleeding, so there's no difference when it comes to major bleeding between dabigatran and Coumadin. But when you look at um, any bleeding, um, the so this is uh, this line here is dabigatran, and this line here is. Coumadin, and there's a lower low risk of bleeding with dabigatran as well. So three medications now showing that they're as if equal and show that they're less, less bleeding risk when it comes to, uh, to um, uh, venous thrombolysis treatment and pulmonary embolism treatment. So this is what the ACCP just um, uh, guidelines mentioned. So in 2012, they said that they suggest vitamin K antagonist Coumadin versus low molecular weight heparin, and the reason why for, uh, is because it's just cheaper and easier to use. That's the only reason why. And then they mentioned that, um, in, um, you know, they recommend, again, vitamin K or low market weight heparin over dabigatran or rivaroxaban. That's because there were some studies out there and were really not that significant study regarding those two medications. So in 2016, so these guidelines just came out three weeks ago. So they're actually just in print. They're online only. And uh, they're actually going in, uh, the ACCP is going to a series of updates into their 
um, ant anticoagulation and um, treatments of venous thromboembolism. So this is the first update from a series of updates into the 10 edition. So it just came out three weeks ago. And their recommendation now is that in patients with no history of cancer um, who needs anticoagulation, to we, they suggest dabigatran, rivaroxam, and dixabam, and indoxabam as your first-line treatment over, um, over Coumadin. And then, uh, of course, um, so yeah, so Coumadin is not your first-line treatment anymore. So that's why you have to be familiar, because a lot of these medications, are the, you're going to see a lot of these patient, patients in your clinic with these medications, and you need to be familiar with them. So they're actually, it actually seems like they're superior just because of a decreased bleeding risk. So that's their guideline that just came out right now, three weeks ago, to be exact. Yes? So, would you go back to that? Mm hmm Recommendation from this What was that, sir? They have a recommendation for the same old world of warfarin, right? Yes. Yes. So, so there's no studies out there. So they didn't. Com they com most of the studies compared Coumadin, and that's what we use usually. So to compare Coumadin and no cancer patients. I'm going to talk about cancer uh, pa cancer patients specifically, but uh, um, I mean, those. I think these medications are cheaper and lower. Uh, I'm not. Unless you have a reason to. There's no. Re there's no studies out there that tell me that. Um, you know, these new medications are better than Lovenox, or Lovenox is better than them, or Lovenox happens. So I can't really answer that question just because there's no studies out there that kind of looks into that. But there is specific populations, I think, that, you know, Lovenox might be better, and I'm going to touch about that later on. Well, I don't think they looked into that. So I'm not sure I haven't looked into the other studies and what they showed, but they're basing their, their recommendations are ba specifically based on these trials that I just talked about. And they didn't really comment, I looked at the uh, comments, they didn't really comment about increased risk of bleeding in the other trials when compared to AFib. So I'm not really sure, but they specifically looked at these trials only, and that's, what they, um, that's why they made these recommendations. So your first question is Yeah. Yeah, so I that yeah, I didn't really go into that, <laughs> but yeah, so. And like I said, these are my questions that I made, so. Um, are you going to comment on this first three months thing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You will, because there is a new study coming. About? So I would email the one of the funds, there will be a new study uh, after the first three months of months regulation comparing 100 milligrams of alcohol to 200 versus 100 milligrams of alcohol. Okay, so, so I'm going to touch about that a little bit. Okay. But, um, so we'll look into that. Yeah. Well, I mean, if the publish not, uh, is not published, is it published yet? No, no. Okay, so, okay, so, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I tried to do as much research as I can, but I guess I didn't do it that, that well. <laughs> um, so, okay, so let's go to the next question. So, 54-year-old uh, male, history of hypertension, osteoarthritis, and a prostate cancer on hormonal treatment. Um, admitted to the hospital with shortness of breath and diagnosed with bilateral uh, segmental pulmonary embolism. Started in heparin admitted. Uh, you're attempting to transition this patient um, for an early discharge. What's the best anticoagulation and discharge this patient on? So, low melt weight heparin or nexaparin, that's what you usually use. Coumadin, Fondaparinox, Rivaroxaban, or Dabigatran. Last time I had like 22 or 23. Okay, 21, so I guess we'll stop there. Okay, so low molecular weight heparin. So most few people got the correct answer, or I think is the correct answer, and let's look at the evidence. Um, so, so this is... Um, a meta-analysis came, came out uh, about two years ago looking into um, this specific question. So they compared low molecular weight heparin and vitamin uh, K antagonists or Coumadin in cancer patients. So what we found, if you look at here at the uh, forest plot, the pooled analysis, um, you'll have that low molecular weight heparin. Th so they're looking at recurrent venous thromboembolism. So you can see the risk of uh, recurrence of venous thromboembolism, which is DVT or PE, is actually lower with low molecular weight heparin um, compared to uh, Coumadin. 
But if you actually look into the studies, most of the studies were not significant other than one, which is Dr. Lee's study. This is a clot study. And it's, the reason why is because it's weighted more. So it's, um, and that's because it's a, it's a better study. It has more patients in there. And in that study, it showed that the recurrence of uh, venous thrombosis is actually um, lower with, uh, with um, low molecular weight heparin. So, you know, that's what, so, but hav having said that though, um, you know, the other studies didn't really show much difference. And there's actually a new study that came out uh, last year. It's also a Dr. Lee study. It's called the CATCH study. So this is a clot study. The new study is called the CATCH study. It actually had 900 patients with cancer treated with low molecular weight heparin versus Coumadin. And they found that there's no difference uh, when it comes to um, a recurrent venous thrombolysis. So there's really no difference between low molecular weight heparin and vitamin K. So um, I really don't know if, you know, even that have a strong argument for recurrence with uh, um, low molecular weight heparin for cancer patients, but there is some data out there. Um, when it comes to mortality, I always thought that the reason why we have to use low molecular weight heparin is because it decreases, m there's lower risk of m lower mortality. Uh, for some reason, I assumed that, I've been told that, and I just believed it, but uh, I actually looked at the data, and the Cochrane actually did um, a, a meta-analysis and came out again, I think, last year, and they pulled all these studies together, so Dr. Myers, Lee, and Hall study, and there's really no difference in mortality when it comes to um, low molecular weight heparin versus uh, vitamin K antagonist. And even the new study, um, the, the CATCH study that came out last year also showed that there's no mortality benefits at all. I think the only reason that, that uh, they're saying there's a decreased mortality is because the CATCH or the CLOT study uh, with Dr. Lee, uh, they found, so they treated for six months and then they stopped. So there's no difference in mortality within six months, but then they did like a post hoc analysis and they found that in 12, in 12 months, uh, risk mortality was actually lower. Um, but that's after they stopped the medication, so I don't know that what, the, what that means exactly, but uh, I couldn't really find strong evidence for lower mortality risk. Um, then, in this meta-analysis, what they also did is they actually took all the patients with um, cancer from the studies that I just mentioned regarding the new medications. Uh, so they compared the new anticoagulations compared to um, vitamin K antagonists. And what they found that the, in terms of um, recurrence for venous thrombolysis, there is no difference at all. So they're actually in cancer patients. You can actually, sh I mean, there's no, I have no data saying that the new medications are not as good as Coumadin. Now, there's no study out there that compares the new anticoagulations to um, low molecular heparin, so I can't answer that question if you have it. But uh, um, in terms of the new medication compared to Coumadin, there's no difference at all. So these are the, again, these are the new guidelines from CHEST uh, or ACCP, and they mentioned um, uh, in patients with DVT or PE who need therapy, they still recommend low molecular weight heparin, um, but if you cannot use low molecular weight heparin, you can use the other agents. And if it was me, I would try low molecular weight heparin. If the patient doesn't want it, I won't really lose any sleep to it, and I'll think of it with the other agent. The evidence is not that great, other than maybe may low risk of recurrence. So question three. So 61-year-old female, medical history of hypertension, diastolic dysfunction, hyperthyroidism, and GERD, presents the clinic for recent diagnosis of uh, bilateral segmental pulmonary embolism. So detailed history shows that there's no recent travel, no hormonal replacement therapy, IVDA, previous miscarriages, previous uh, venous thrombolism, family history of uh, venous thrombolism, uh, she's updated with her cancer screening. She was started on Abixabam and was discharged from the hospital without incident. She's using clinic, wondering how long she needs to be on oral anticoagulation. What is the best course of action? So this is a patient with unprovoked um, PE. So what do you want to do? So do you want to treat for indefinitely, 3, 12, 24 months, or 6 months? Okay, so 20, 25, okay, I think that's good. Oh, so that's a little bit all over the place. Okay, so I think the best answer is indefinitely for unprovoked PE, first unprovoked PE, and we'll look into the data and see why. So this is um, risk of venous thrombolism recurrence. So this is basically pulled uh, from, the, from the ninth edition of the, of the chest practice guidelines. And they mentioned that for a provoked PE surgical risk, the risk recurrence is very low. So 1% in one year, 3% in uh, three years. 
If it's provoked but with a non-surgical trigger, it's a little bit more, so 5% in one year, 15% in two years. While it's unprovoked, it's pretty high, so 10% in the first year and 3%, I'm sorry, 30% in, um, in three years. So let's look at the data exactly. So let's look at provoked PE first. So this is a pooled kind of meta-analysis from um, that ACCP has created from um, their 2012 guidelines, so the ninth edition. So what they had is they compared, um, so they compared short-term treatment, which is four to six weeks, versus three to six months treatment for provoked uh, PE, and they found that the recurrence risk is higher in the patient who had short-term treatment, so four to six weeks. And there's no difference in major bleeding and mortality. So we know definitely that short-term treatment is not enough. So a few weeks is not enough. A month to two months is not enough. So then they compared studies that look into six or 12 months versus three months only. And they found that um, the recurrent venous thrombolism, there's no difference at all between the two groups. And they pulled about six studies for that, while major bleeding was actually higher in the longer duration. So um, in the six to 12 month duration of treatment, the risk of bleeding was actually higher. And mortality was kind of the same. So that's kind of, a lot of the guidelines will say provoked um, uh, PE or DVT would be three months of treatment. Is that what the usual is? So what about a second provoked PE? So honestly, I don't really know what the best answer is. Most uh, guidelines say it's indefinitely. There's no studies out there that just looks at two provoked. Yes? Yeah. Again, we'll go into that later on. But um, reevaluate, of course, because you have to, I mean, treatment of PEs, I mean, guidelines say things, but, you know, the choice of medication, duration of treatment, and it all depends um, on the circumstances. So if you have a patient who has a risk factor for PE, you treat for three months, but the risk factor is still there, then you might consider to treat for longer, and there's no guidelines say that. So you always have to reevaluate when you want to stop the patient. But um, but again, that's a good point about D-dimers and all these things, so I'm going to talk about them again then. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we'll go into it. Just give me a sign. Um, so now we'll talk about the second provoked PE. So again, there's no studies out there um, that looked into just two, you know, two provoked PE, so I can't really tell. There's a study in New England in 97 that kind of had a patient with a second provoked venous thrombolism, whether it's a PE or a, um, a DVT, but again, it included both provoked and, um, and unprovoked. And they found that, you know, long-term treatment, so they compared six months versus four years, and four years is because that's the end of the study, and they found that the recurrence risk is higher in the patient who treated for six months only. And then um, bleeding, there was no difference at all. So again, so this study is saying that maybe um, a longer treatment is beneficial, but again, it included both provoked and unprovoked PE. And we do know that unprovoked PE has a high risk of recurrence. And then there is this other study that came out, I think, April of last year, looking at incidence. And um, what they found is that patients who were treated for, or patients who had uh, second venous embolism, whether it's a PE or um, a DVT, um, their risk of developing a third, so they actually split them into provoked and unprovoked. And the uh, risk of developing a provoked PE after one year is about 20%. I'm sorry, after an unprovoked PE, the risk of recurrence is about 20% in one year and about 40% in five years. And the risk for a second provoked, um, for the chance of you developing a third PE, I mean, after your second provoked um, renal sample embolism, the first year is about 10% and five years about 20%. So not, not that low. So. You know, a second PE, a second provoked PE. Actually, we had this, I don't know if Dr. Morris is here, but we had a similar patient who had a similar, uh, who had a similar situation like that. She had two surgeries and she developed PEs on both occasions. And she came to our clinic two weeks ago and uh, we were wondering, she was wondering how long she needs to be on her, the Roxabam she was on. And we were asking that question and I, I really did not know that, I did not know answer then. After doing this talk, I still don't know what the answer would be. I think the best thing to do, like Saeed said, is to reevaluate in three months. Um, in her case, she did have family history um, of venous thrombolism, so I think in her, with the, she had low risk of bleeding, so I would maybe suggest for long-term treatment, but again, you have to kind of look at your patients and make a decision then. 
guidelines don't really are not very specific. So now we're talking about, so this is Mahana's question, right? So you unprovoked PE. So this is a study that came out last year in JAMA. Um, and they actually looked at unprovoked pulmonary embolism. So it's a randomized trial. They had patients treated for six months of anticoagulation with Coumadin. And they split them, and then what they did, and then they randomized them to either st placebo or continue treatment for another 18 months with Coumadin. And what they found is that the patients who had treatment for about two years um, had a decreased risk of recurrence of venous thromboembolism, and there was no difference of bleeding. So they treated them for two years compared to two, six months and found there was a decreased risk. But what was in interesting about the study, though, is that um, you can see here the patients, so this is risk of recurrence. So Coumadin had a low risk of recurrence during the treatment period of 18 months, with, which you, you would expect, compared to placebo who had a uh, higher risk of recurrence since they stopped treatment. So they treated for six months, and this group continued treatment for another 18 months. This group stopped treatment and were just on placebo. So that's what the study showed at 18 months, that recurrence is high in the placebo group. But what was interesting is that after, so once they stopped the Coumadin on both, on both groups, or sorry, stopped treatment, whether it's placebo or Coumadin on both groups, they followed them um, for another several years and what they found is actually the risk of venous thrombolysis in the Coumadin group actually went, went up and also almost uh, equaled placebo. So there is benefit for longer duration, but if you stop it, the risk of recurrence is actually goes back up again. The risk of them developing PPE is actually high, again, goes up. So this sh shows that long-term treatment is beneficial and there is argument to treat them for unprovoked PE or DVT, um, but we're talking about PE, to treat them for lifelong. So this is looking at PE, so treating them for lifelong because the risk of recurrence is actually high. And then, of course, at major bleeding, there was no difference. So there's no difference in major bleeding at 18 months, and then, of course, when they stop treatment, there is no difference in, in bleeding at all. So that's my argument to treating a first unprovoked uh, PE for um, lifelong. Um, and the guidelines, again, um, also kind of recommend the same thing. So this is, again, the new guidelines, ACCP mentions that it's a DVT or a PE, if it's unprovoked and they have a lower moderate risk of bleeding, or low risk of bleeding, they uh, recommend extended anticoagulation, and by extended they mean indefinite, over three months. If they have a high risk of bleeding, then you do three months in that over, over not over extended. And again, you have to evaluate the patients once you stop. So, you know, a lot of evidence shows out there. So uh, first unprovoked PE, they treat indefinitely. So uh, what about a second unprovoked PE? So I just made an argument for, you know, two provoked PEs and the, uh, to treat indefinitely. I made an argument to treat your first unprovoked PE indefinitely. So if you have a second unprovoked PE, then, and you have a low risk, then treat indefinitely. I don't, the risk is very high, 50% in five years. So if there's no, if there's low risk, then you have to treat indefinitely or you should, and that's what most guidelines say. What about those patients with cancer? So again, so in cancer patients, their 12 months risk of developing a PE is very high, so 13% incidental PEs and tw about 17% symptomatic. I don't have three or five years data, it's just because they don't live that long, so uh, I can't really get good numbers for you, but their risk of developing um, recurrence is actually very high. So what does the guideline say in cancer patients? So they recommend, so ACCP, their old and new guidelines, they haven't really changed the recommendation. In patients with active cancer um, who, have, who do not have high risk of bleeding to treat um, indefinitely with no scheduled stop date over three months treatment. Even the high risk of bleeding, they really want to push uh, for extended anticoagulation with no scheduled stop date. Um, American Society of Clinical Oncology um, in the 2013 guidelines really want to push you for uh, long-term therapy as well, so over six months um, of therapy. So I went in and I, wanna, I looked into um, why they made these recommendations, and I couldn't really find any studies that looks into this. It's basically they're making these recommendations, which kind of makes sense, is because the risk of recurrence is very high. Um, so. You, that's basically why they're saying that you should treat long term. I don't have a study that have cancer patient treated for six months versus, you know, two years. Um, but just because of the risk of recurrence is very high, is as high as unprovoked PE 
um, or even if not higher, they're saying you have to treat them definitely if they still have active cancer. So um, this is an interesting study that came out in circulation in 2012. And what they did is um, they actually tried to find, look at those cancer patients and find who is high risk and who is low risk. Is all, are all cancer high risk or maybe there's some people that you can treat for a shorter period of time. So this actually had a lot of big uh, uh, people who are very uh, knowledgeable and well published in the field. So Dr. Wells, Dr. Myers, Dr. Lee, some of the studies that I just mentioned before had all these, um, um, had all these uh, um, authors in it. And what they did, so this, they created the Ottawa score. So, um, by the way, Canada does a lot of these anticoagulation um, uh, studies. So a lot of the uh, studies I'm mentioning are actually from Canada. And they found that through a logistic regression, they found that gender, type of cancer, stage, and previous history of venous thrombolism, those four factors um, were associated with recurrence. So a score of z less than zero, so zero to negative three, negative three to zero, is actually have a low risk uh, probability of developing venous thrombolism. And they actually went ahead and validated that. So they, that's a uh, derivation study, and they went to validation. And you can see that anyone with a score of negative one to three really had a low risk of recurrence within one year, either zero to five percent, and that's pretty low. So maybe those patients you can actually treat for a short period of time. I don't really know. This needs to be evaluated further than that. But I think by that time, the patient who has active cancer probably has an um, oncologist on board, and I'll defer the decision up to them to discontinue or not discontinue. But that's what you know the data really shows. So okay, next question. So 45-year-old male recently diagnosed with unprovoked PE six weeks ago. Started on heparin and is doing well. He, uh, he states that he wants to go back playing football and does not want to be on uh, to continue on Coumadin uh, for more than a required duration. What is the best next course of action? So these are your possible answers. Stop Coumadin in three months and place an IVC filter. Check a D-dimer in three months and if normal then stop warfarin. Stop warfarin in three months and start patient on daily aspirin. Stop warfarin and start him on dabigatrin due to lower bleeding risk and continue, continue anticoagulation since it's impossible to exsanguinate from an intracranial bleed, which technically is true. Okay. Okay, we have a 19 responses, so 20 now, so let's go ahead. In. Okay, so check a D-dimer three months of normal and stop warfarin. That's interesting, but I think that's the incorrect answer. I think the correct answer is to start daily aspirin, and here's why. Um, so this is an inspired collaboration, so it's basically a pooled data from um, two studies looking into aspirin treatment. And um, it was published in circulation two years ago. And what they found, so this is our patients with DVTs who completed treatment and then were started either on placebo or started on aspirin. And they found that the risk of recurrence was lower in the aspirin group compared to the placebo group. So you can see that hazard ratio of 0.68, which was statistically significant. So um, you can see here, same study, um, the risk of uh, venous thrombolism was less major vascular events, which includes venous thrombolism, DV, um, MIs, and strokes were, uh, mm -hmm. were reduced compared to placebo. Pulmonary embolism was also reduced, but it was not statistically, statistically significant. DVT was definitely reduced and was statistically significant. No difference in mortality, no difference in bleeding. So, and what they also did is they, they kind of compared each year, and you can see that there's a high dropout rate in terms of taking aspirin for four years, so that's maybe why the there's a lower um, power uh, for the um, DVT uh, PE group, but you can definitely see that within the first year, um, the risk is much lower in terms of recurrence um, in the aspirin group compared to placebo. And when you pull them all together, uh, placebo had a percent uh, event rate of 7.5 percent compared to aspirin, which is 5.1, and that was statistically significant. So. So basically, a little bit in English, basically the number needed to treat to prevent one venous thrombolism was 42 in one year, and number, uh, three, three, uh, number needed to treat uh, to prevent one major vascular event in a year was 31 patients compared to placebo. Mm -hmm. 
100. I think it was 100. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe I spelled it wrong. I think it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's the same. Maybe I spelled it wrong. Huh? But yeah, they pulled those studies together and, this, and we called it called it inspired collaboration. So this is the new recommendations from um, ACCP. So they said if you have to stop anticoagulation for whatever reason, uh, patient preference, risk of bleeding, but the and the patient and you want to stop it and you want to start anticoagulation again, or the patient doesn't want it, you should start them on aspirin unless they have a con contraindication to aspirin. I mean, everyone's on aspirin right now. You kind of sprinkle it on your, you should sprinkle it probably on a little bit of your food. That was statin, so I think uh, that that's sounds reasonable. So what about D-dimer? You know, people, a lot, 50% 50, 50 of you have chose D-dimer, right? So why not D-dimer? So there is studies out, there's a study out there that looked into DBTs, and what they did is they combined D-dimers, so a negative D-dimer, and then they did an ultrasound um, of the lower extent used to check for both a negative D-dimer and they checked for stability of the clot or there's no, no new clots. And in those, in that population, the risk of recurrence is low. So that population, you might want to consider stopping anticoagulation. But we're not talking about DVDs here, we're talking about PE. So um, this is a study published last year, I think it was Jan January, I'm not sure exactly when last year, but it was published in 2015, and I think some of the fellows here would um, recognize this name. So Dr. Scott Cates was one of the publishers. He um, used to be one of the associate program directors in internal medicine here. Um, he actually taught me when I was an intern. Um, he's very, very well uh, published in this field. He actually is one of the co-authors co of the Bridge Trial, which came back in August in the New England Journal. So um, very well published, and actually um, Henry Ford was part of this study, so 27 uh, uh, patients that were uh, part of the participants was from Henry Ford. So, um, so what did they do here? So basically what they did is um, they took patients with, um, they took patients with pulmonary embolism, or uh, recurrent, uh, so basically venous thrombolism. I think 55% of them were PE patients. And what they did is basically they checked, they treated them for three to six months, um, and they check the D-dimer at that time. If it was low, they stop anticoagulation. And then they check a D-dimer again a month later. If it was low, or normal I should say, um, they just discontinue anticoagulation completely. And then they follow them up and see what happens. So what you see is that in men, the risk of um, being a strong, recurrent oh. venous thrombosis was still high. It's about 10% um, uh, actually in, in the first year, which is actually pretty high, so it's unacceptably high. So that's in men. Um, in patients, in es estrogen women, which means that um, uh, women who are on home or, or, um, hormone replacement therapy, um, and then they stop and they developed a DVT uh, PE from that, and they stopped it. The risk was actually very low. And then non and women who are not taking estrogen or hormone replacement therapy, the, the risk was about five percent in the first year. So, really, maybe in women. Uh, who not take uh, in a woman with a normal D dimer, you might consider stopping anticoagulation, but I would not. I would not do that in men. So I, I would. That still needs to be studied, and I would not check D dimer. I would not use D dimer to dictate my anticoagulation. Not yet, anyway. And I don't think any of the guidelines kind of mention using them. And this study here that came out last year just shows that the risk is an unacceptably high, even if the D dimer is low. So what about IBC filters? So, um, so there's no study that compares filters versus medical management, so I can't really say. But when should we use them? And there's a complicated, like every treatment, there's complications. So there's this a pooled um, um, meta-analysis um, looking into, um, in 2011, looking into the complications of uh, venous thrombosis and, um, and PEs and IBC filters. And what you can see that the risk is actually pretty low. So in a lot of patients, the recurrence risk of 1.3% only. But then you also have the other risks. That, so you have DVTs, which is 5.4%, pretty high, filter migration, uh, and thrombosis as well. And there's also al al other risks associated with IVC filters. Um, 
And this is not really part of my talk, it's not really outpatient management, but I found these studies to be interesting, which is why I incorporated them into my talk today. So this is a study long in 2005 in circulation, and what they actually did is that they had patients with PE, they started them on anticoagulation, and if they had a proximal DVT, they placed um, an IVC filter as well, a permanent IVC filter. So you have uh, six months of treatment anticoagulation and a permanent IVC filter, and they followed them for eight years. And what they found is that um, the risk of recurrence is low of PE in the patients who were, had an IVC filter, but they also had increased um, development of DVTs as well. Um, so that was then, 2005. Um, now, with the introduction of a uh, more um, retrievable IV fil IVC filter, which is what we use, so they actually recreated the study again. So the same group of people came out with a study ja in JAMA last year. So what they did is basically treated for three to six months with anticoagulation, and there was a, so w first of all, they had a patients who had a proximal DVT, and that they had PE as well, so DVT and PE, and they had risk factors. Uh, so they either, they had to have some sort of risk factors, so they either had cancer patients, high troponin, high BMP, RV strain, something like that, at least one of them, one risk factor. And if they did, they included them in the trial. And what they did is they put an IVC, a retrieval IVC filter in a group for three months and then removed it, while the other group was just anticoagulated for six months. And what they found is that there's no difference in recurrence of uh, venous thrombolysis, and there is no difference in DVTs or complication DVTs. They only looked at patients for about a year, though. So the other previous study was more eight years follow-up, while this is only for a year. So this study shows that you know IVC filter might not really have a role um, unless uh, if they're already on anticoagulation. So what is the recommendations in terms of uh, using an IVC filter. So it's basically if someone has a contraindication to anticoagulation, you can't put them on anticoagulation, then you should use an anti uh, um, you should use um, IVC filter. Otherwise, you can have to continue to reevaluate if that whatever risk for bleeding has gone or subsided and you think you can put them on anticoagulation again, you should reconsider and put them on anticoagulation rather than just placing, keeping the IVC filter in place. And always think about removing the IVC filter too. Um, so I just want to touch base a little bit about um, uh, thrombophilus screening. So who should you screen? You should screen someone with a family history. And what does family history mean? Basically someone with another venous thrombolysis at the age of less than 45. Um, so that's what we would say high risk. Um, if someone has a, um, a clot with the age of less than 45, if someone has multiple venous thrombolysis, if someone has a, um, a thrombus in an um, unusual area, for vein, hepatic vein, um, in patients with warfarin-induced skin necrosis and uh, in patients with arterial thrombosis, you should screen all those patients. Um, what do you test for? So usually these are the standard things, so activate 4C, factor 5, for thrombin, 4C, 14S, um, and antithrombin. You should check antiphospholipid. If someone has an arterial thrombosis, definitely you should check antiphospholipid. And you can check a JAK2 mutation only if you find someone with a portal vein or a hepatic vein thrombosis, that's when you should check that because they're uh, hi highly associated. So you should only screen, you should not screen everyone, that's very well um, commented in all, a, a lot of the guidelines, you only should screen selected groups and those are the groups that I just mentioned. What about cancer screening? Now I'm not sure who, which role, whose role is it to scan, is it I guess pulmonologists should not do that, but primary care and maybe oncologists, but how we know when you have someone with unprovoked venous thrombolysis, who should you screen? And this is a study that just came out August in 2015, and just that's why I want to include it in my talk because it's more recent. And uh, what they did is basically looked into um, patients uh, with unprovoked uh, venous thrombolysis, whether it's a DVT or PE, and they did either just a usual standard screening screening for that age group, whatever age you are, and they compared it to the same thing, so just a usual care plus the CT abdomen pelvis and they found that there's really no difference. So there's no difference in um, finding cancer in the two groups, and there's no difference in missed cancer in the two groups as well. So I think if someone, if in terms of cancer screening, you just do the age-appropriate cancer screening is enough and nothing more elaborate than that. So I think that's mostly my talk. So summary, um, outpatient management of PE is real and you should really push for low risk patients to be discharged early. 
Um, they should be discharged from the ED, to be honest with you. But if they are admitted on the floor, you can discharge them early. They're low, low risk. New, new anticoagulation are now first line, so that's why you should be using, unless there's a reason not to. Uh, treat provoked PE for three months. Strongly consider treating second provoked PE lifelong. Treat unprovoked PE lifelong. First unprovoked PE. Treat cancer associated thrombosis lifelong. Consider aspirin is uh, uh, in patients not an anticoagulation. Ro uh, role of D-dimer is not well defined yet in PEs. Um, consider hypercoagulable workup in selected patient population and age-appropriate cancer screening in patients with unprovoked PE is enough. So I'd like to thank Dr. Lazar. One thing I didn't comment on, so I didn't talk about CTEF in my uh, talk, so I think that's, uh, um, I think that's just has a talk on its own. I think Dr. Higab gave a, gave a talk about this last year, so don't ask me about, um, um, don't ask me about that, and don't ask me about when to do echoes, Dr. Shaban, uh, so you can look at that. Um, so. Yes, Dr. Paul. Well, I mean, I'm not sure, but so the study that I showed showed that aspirin actually works. Okay. And it's actually been uh, studied as well in, in DVTs as well, I think. Um, but this, the study that I just mentioned showed that aspirin, clearly, it's a well, well done study and actually cl clearly works. So it's a low level, so and the recommendation is proper Oh, oh I, that's, that's a good point. So the, the, the recommendation is use a so a anticoagulation is much superior to aspirin. But if you can't use anticoagulation, aspirin should be your second line. Like a little bit. Yes, that's a little bit of something, yeah, exactly. Because the recommendation is aspirin versus nothing. Correct. That, that's what better than it's exactly better than nothing. So it's aspirin versus placebo, not aspirin versus anticoagulation. Yes.